Excellent. Great. Well, we're, we're happy to have everyone here tonight. Um, I'm Dirk. I'm from, from Visa, and we're, we're excited to host this uh, session tonight with the Hive. And uh, I just want to tell you a couple of things about we have exits in the back, in the front, um, if there's an emergency. There's bathrooms that are just outside through the turnstiles. Um, and I guess I'll turn it over to the Hive. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you, good evening everyone, and thank you for coming to the Hive Think Tank. Uh, if tweeting tonight, please just use um, Hive data. The Hive Think Tank is a forum for thought leadership. We focus on entrepreneurship and all things data. These are just a few speakers that were on the Hive stage in the past. We had over 150 events organized since our inception. In our database, uh, we have uh, 8,000 data-driven innovators. These are data scientists, uh, entrepreneurs, developers, and uh, corporate users. We had also 200 speakers on the stage. The next upcoming event uh, is the focus on the uh, on Hadoop, Hadoop is turning 10, and the talk by Doug Cutting, his father of Hadoop, will be taking place at San Jose Commercial Center on the 29th. It's a week away. So uh, the event is taking place during the week of Hadoop and Strata World uh, Conference, but you don't have to attend the conference. You can come to the event and listen to Doug's talk. You just register online through our Meetup page, and it's open to all, and it's free. Uh, all our upcoming events you can find on our website, on hivedata.com. Without them, without our sponsors and partners, many of our events wouldn't have happened, and we'd like to give a big shout out to them. Thank are brought to you by the Hive. What Hive is, more from co-founder and managing partner of the Hive, Ian Rabbit. Thank you. My mic works, yeah. So many people ask me, what is, uh, what is the Hive and how is it different? So the Hive is, a, is different from an accelerator or an incubator. It's really a studio, an innovation studio in some sense to create companies. So we partner with entrepreneurs and work actively with them. So it's a high-touch model. Um, we have a CTO, we have product executives who, who work with these entrepreneurs, typically for the first 12, 15 months, and, and help them create their companies. The other unique aspect of the Hive is that every, we're very focused. So everything we do is related to applications and use cases driven by, by data uh, across Internet of Things, online and enterprise. And, and we have a few sort of themes of special interest to us. And no surprise, you know, themes driven by kind of machine learning, deep learning, automation, new generation of enterprise applications, security and privacy, um, our sort of focus in financial services largely driven by the opportunities from blockchain. Um, you'll see kind of a lot of uh, interest now in camera-based applications, you know, for navigation, for surveillance, for industrial inspection, kind of using kind of in some cases AR, VR. Um, so those are some of our themes. Um, just kind of a little bit related to the topic of today. Uh, a lot of what we do is in collaboration with, with um, corporations, uh, other incubators and accelerators and universities. And, and so uh, with corporations, we are typically kind of engaging with them early on during the ideation phase, trying to sort of understand you know, from people who are experts in a certain domain what the white spaces are. You know, and, and start getting a sense that if we were able to create a company in this space, uh, would these corporations be good go-to-market partners? And then just bringing these corporations close to the company so that they can kind of 
be innovation partners and, and take them to market and, and just stay close to them. We, we have a very similar approach with universities. With, with incubators and accelerators, they tend to be kind of boot camp style, high volume, low touch, low capital uh, entities. And so when, when someone finishes with an accelerator incubator, and many of them are, far, are partners, plug and play, final startups, uh, Y Combinator, in many cases they're not ready for uh, a traditional VC. And so that's sort of a gap that, that we fill. Typically we'll, we'll put a kind of million and a half to two million dollars up front in a company and, and work closely with them for a year, year and a half. And then they're ready for sort of significant capital in the series A. Uh, please uh, tweet tonight. The hashtag is, is Hive Data. And so with that, I'd like to um, uh, introduce our, our speakers tonight. So Steve Blank needs no introduction. <laughs> That's long enough. Uh, he, he's well known for, for you know, the, the, the lean startup met methodology, the customer uh, development approach. Uh, many of you know his book, which is almost like a reference book for, for startups. Um, he has also been, uh, you know, an executive uh, uh, kind of entrepreneur in a number of well-known companies, uh, MIPS, uh, Convergent Technologies, uh, uh, Epiphany uh, here in the in the valley, and is active um, as a as a professor uh, teaching entrepreneurship at. Uh, uh, UC Berkeley, Stanford, uh, Columbia, and so on and, and so forth. Um, and he just told me that he used to be on the Coastal Commission, but that's not an easy job. So he's no longer on the Coastal Commission. We, we have a house in Point Reyes, and I know that's, that's a kind of controversial job. <laughs> um, my good friend uh, Evangelos is, is really kind of, I would say, uh, a unique combination of of being a venture capitalist, being an operating executive, being a kind of entrepreneur, um, has uh, you know been for a number of years at at APAX, at Trident, and most recently at Corporate Innovation Partners uh, that he also uh, founded, and has been on the board of a number of very successful um, companies, um, Brightroll. Um, Princeton, Softtech, uh, uh, and, and a whole bunch of other, other companies. Um, he's, he's also been, uh, and I, I know him well because of his association with data, and so among the other sort of uh, operating roles he's had, he was uh, responsible for IBM's BI, business intelligence business. So with that, maybe we'll get started. Anything else? Uh, if you tweet, use, use the hashtag. So we'll, we'll go for about an hour, maybe 45 minutes to an hour, and then open it out for Q&A. So please hold your questions. And, and we'll, we'll line up there for questions. So, so I want to know if traffic on 101 is related to the size of data sets. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> is that proportional uh, increase in data? It must traffic, be. Right? It must be. So good, we'll, we'll maybe get just started with, um, you know, just kind of set a foundation and, and Steve, maybe just tell us, give us a kind of just a Reader's Digest version of just what is the sort of lean startup approach as, uh, lean approach as applied to startups and we'll kind of then move to sort of corporations. Well, the Reader's Digest approach is that uh, in the 20th century, uh, venture capitalists told early stage ventures, essentially without using these words, that startups were nothing more than smaller versions of large companies. And that everything a large company did, a startup thing that you do, they write a business plan, you write a business plan. They write a five-year forecast that said $100 million a year five, so will you. They hire VPs of sales, marketing, and biz dev, and use waterfall engineering to execute, so, you, so will you. Without ever once understanding that large companies were actually executing known business models. But startups were searching for business models. But we didn't even have that language to understand that distinction. We also didn't understand that for 100 years, business schools have been turning out strategy, theory, practice for execution. In fact, creating a whole cadre of management called Masters of Business Administration. And actually did a good job of creating people who knew how to administer a 
but here is the key idea, existing companies. But we have very few tools other than go write a business plan to tell startups and founders that what they were doing was something different than what people executing in large companies. So that's the preamble to answering your question with the Lean Startup was, was the first kind of management tool set to start thinking about what do you do that's different in a either a new venture or a trying to be an entrepreneur inside a large corporation. And the Lean Startup method methodology just said, look, if we understand we're searching for business models rather than executing them, we'll start with and perhaps we ought to realize that most of what we have on day one in a startup is a unset, uh, untested set of hypotheses which, excuse the language, just really means you're effing guessing uh, for most of your stuff. You may have known technology or may have known whatever, but most of the other pieces about commercialization, what's the right channel, what's the right pricing, what's the right feature set, who are even the right customers, what activities and resources you need to do. I don't know, we kind of bubbled our way through that, and enough companies succeeded that venture capital made money, but it was enormously wasteful. And so the Lean Startup said, why don't we use a way to kind of A, admit that they're just hypotheses, use a piece of, uh, of methodology invented by someone named Alexander Osterwalter, where we use a thing called the business model canvas, which is a single piece of paper that allows us to write down all our hypotheses. And then the second piece, which is only three pieces to lean, says, well, thanks for writing down all these hypotheses. We're now gonna force you to get out of your office and test them in front of customers right now. Not later, not when you ship, not whenever, but from day one. And I don't care if you're the technical founder, we're going to teach you how to make eye contact. Um, and, and, <laughs> that is the difference between an introvert and an extrovert for the scientists and engineers I teach is whether they're looking at their shoes or your shoes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we do teach them to keep our lean, and, and it's teachable. It's all because they're smart enough, we just teach them how to go into emulation mode and uh, teach them how to emulate empathy, and they're pretty good at it. But two is actually to test, you know, test all those hypotheses on the business model canvas. And the third component of that testing was Eric Reese's contribution. So the lean startup was business model canvas, customer development mind, canvas, entrepreneur, and third piece was Eric Reese's observation that instead of using waterfall engineering, GC, for the 21st century, we invented agile. And we ought to use agile engineering to build what are called minimum viable products. Minimum viable product is not a prototype. Minimum viable product is whatever gets us the most learning at that time about part of the hypotheses. It could be a spreadsheet, it could be a software uh, a wireframe, it could be a cardboard mock-up, but we're now getting out of the building, not just talking to people, but actually testing each part of the business model. So those three components, business model design, customer development, agile engineering, make up a lean startup. And the best summary of this was the cover of the Harvard Business Review, May 2013, we said the lean startup changes everything, in this case, for companies. And my involvement was an evangelist smacking me on the side of the head and going, Steve, you know, large companies are starting to do this as well, and it ain't working well. Um, how come? Can I, can I answer the question? Yes, yes, yes. And how come? Why, 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 are they, why does this approach sort of, uh, does it work if, if it just kind of popped on top of a, a regular corporation? Gosh, I was going to start. Slightly different, which is most corporations um, do, do not even, they're just now becoming aware that um, Silicon Valley is not only about coming and enjoying the weather or going up and down 101 or, or whatever. <laughs> but, um, there, there There's not much of going up and down this time. Yeah, okay, whatever. <laughs> or, uh, but there is actually a, a set of best practices that um, have, have been developed, such as the lead startup, such as you know, uh, venture portfolio management, and which are now need to be adopted uh, and uh, and utilized. Uh, so this, this this first piece is now corporations becoming aware of it and starting to get get educated, so that then they can they can start applying it. Uh, both uh, internally to their own employees, but also to uh, entrepreneurs they want to attract in order to uh, to work on on their on their company. 
And, and, and so just going back to kind of the lean startup approach, um, have you seen sort of corporations sort of applying it and what has sort of the, the result been? Yeah, we're, we're probably, how many of you are from large companies? Corporations. Corporations. And, and so none of this applies to your company, of course. <laughs> <laughs> These are the corporate innovators. Right, but yeah. right. You're, you were the guys who get it. Yeah. But look, let me tell you why I really got involved after Avengers was, oh, this is the stuff's being used. It's innovation theater right now. And by innovation theater, it means, you know, right now, lean innovation in most companies are, you know, let's have a corporate incubator, let's put up the posters in the cafeteria, let's, you know, rah, 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 put some teams in, the CEO will write a memo, we'll issue a press release, and we'll say we're doing lean. And then we'll come back for years, and, and by the way, and, and we'll visit the valley. We'll visit the valley, and, you know, <laughs> we, might even, we might even, as evangelists calls them, set up an innovation outpost, right? Uh, but, but, the, but really, the operators, the heads of the business units, are just kind of standing there, kind of, <laughs> and then you look around three and a half years later, and you say, okay, did we move the needle? Did we anything move? Did we move the bottom line, the top line? Did more initiatives actually not get just started? We got a lot of stuff started. Did we actually agree on a pipeline of stuff that's actually getting integrated into our operating divisions? And the answer is not only no, it's actually giving all this stuff a bad name. Because we can say, see, we, we did this stuff, this didn't work, let's just keep buying more stuff. Um, and, and so this is when we start working together, trying to understand not only the what's wrong, but why as every day, week, month, year goes by, it becomes more desperate for corporations. Most of them actually makes me think of that great far side cartoon of you know the two dinosaurs kind of laughing hysterically as this big comet is going by the sky about to hit the ground. Uh, you know, large corporations are being disrupted continuously. The average lifespan of a company in the 20th century is 60 years. So far now in the 20th century, I think the number you can give angles is plenty. And it's not getting longer, guys, it's getting shorter. And the answer isn't, by the way, the question is. Why is that happening? And it isn't because companies have gotten stupider. Of course not. It's just that the world has changed faster than they've been able to adapt and adopt. Well, I was going to say that, in going back to the startup, there are a couple of things that have happened. We have cracked the code on how to create startups, and that's very important. I did my first startup in 1990, and at that point, we were learning experientially, right? And, and we were, and by the, by the way, at that time, there weren't as many VCs. So uh, we, were, we were trying, you know, they would provide some guidance. Now, by, by the time I did my second one in the late 90s, it, it was a little better, but, but not where it is today. And I spent the next 15 years investing in them. So we have cracked the code on how to create startups. We have also, I won't call it crack the code, but, but the, we have created a, an enormous number of sources for financing those efforts. And the final thing is that because of open source and, and other, uh, other movements like this, which have made the, the cost of the base level assets, in, especially in certain technology, in certain areas, extremely inexpensive, we are now able to create a very large number of startups. And guess what? Those guys, especially those focusing on, on corporations, they're just going after the corporations and us. And it's, uh, there's some very interesting graphics to see that it's not even going at the corporation as a whole, but they're going after business unit by business unit. And, and that, um, I would say, three years ago may have gone unnoticed. Today is starting to create panic. And just to give you like a one data point, so in the last three years, uh, two and a half years, I have briefed about 180 corporate delegations. Um, I'm going to the innovation theater. Um, 180 corporate delegations from about, a, let's call it 80, 85 different corporations. For, for most of them, um, it is just a checkbox. So only about 
are really interested in saying, okay, now what? And, and this is uh, where the real work begins. I mean, getting on a, on a plane and spending three, four, five days here for the CEO of a multi-billion dollar corporation may appear as a big commitment, time commitment, but it's minuscule compared to what they really have to do if they become serious about startup-driven innovation. Is, is the kind of, you, you see like, you know, you, you talked about sort of uh, innovation becoming a buzzword and so like, you know, like a chief diversity officer or something like that. You see now a chief information officer, a chief, sorry, innovation officer. Is, is that just another kind of uh, a scam or? <laughs> well, it's like much like the chief diversity officer. So, so uh, I, I'm going to work backwards. Uh, so, so it depends on whether they're in the process of reorganizing the company for innovation or not. If they're there to make the board happy, that's a see we got one too, then of course it's a scam. You know, this goes back to, um, Angelus and I kind of like this notion that McKinsey came up with, I think about 20 years ago, called the Three Horizons of Innovation. I think even more so nowadays, it actually makes perfect sense to explain what the heck's going on. It turns out McKinsey said, if you really think about it, that companies tend to do three things when we talk about innovation. Horizon one innovation is they innovate around their core business. We know what our business is, here's what it is, we're experts in the technology and the channel, we can draw the competitors, we can tell you pricing, whatever. And by the way, if we're completely not brain dead, we're innovating in process procedures, better products in our product line, etc. And by the way, every once in a while, we, we not only execute our current business model, that's how we describe Horizon 1 in 21st century language, we sometimes do Horizon 2 innovation, which is we extend our business model. We say, hey, look at this. Here's something called the web. Why don't we have our products not only sold for retail stores, but we could open up a web channel. What genius. That's called Horizon 2, extending a current business model. Or it might be even more creative, like Parker and Gamble. We have all these customers. We know more about them than anybody on Earth. We've got some great manufacturing R&D technology. Why don't we create new products and new segments that's never been designed before, but still within the framework of our channel or business? But what large corporations, are, as evangelists talked about, are getting their butts kicked about is doing what's called Horizon 3 innovation, completely new business models, business models that didn't exist before. The ones that turned Apple Computer into Apple Music and then Apple iPhone. The one that turned Amazon from, oh yeah, we know them, we buy books, to you're now the computing utility for the world for Amazon Web Services, and then again, oh, they also make the Kindle. That is, there are some companies that have continued to radically innovate, or even GE, you know, over 150 years. Oh yeah, you know, yeah, they make light bulbs. No, they make jet engines. Well, and they've done that now continually. It, it, it turns out that one of the core problems, now getting back to why lean startups and companies have such hard time dealing with, now we can give it a language, Horizon 3 innovation, is guess what type of managers are running almost every company in the world? They're not Horizon 3 people, they're Horizon 1 people. And guess who the CFO is? He knows how to count every penny to make the street look good or street happy for Horizon 1. In fact, we threw out R&D, we threw out everything, because we focused on our Horizon 1 efforts. Why? Because we've been essentially driven by, you know, like profits and we use some strange accounting to make our stock price look good. And, and, and so to answer your question, if all you've done is, is have somebody entitled the Chief Innovation Officer and didn't address how are we dealing with the innovation portfolio allocation about resource dollars, uh, about return on investment, which Evangelos could talk about in some detail, across all three horizons of innovation in a corporation, you end up with chief innovation officer just being the person kind of the head of innovation theater. I mean, you might as well have a you know, little clown suit on. Um, and, and that's the difference. If he's the one running innovation portfolio at dollar allocation, then it's a real job. But in, in your kind of the three horizon model, is that chief uh, innovation officer responsible for the third or to make sure that uh, horizon three and horizon two and horizon one work in harmony with each other? So again, similar to what we're saying about lean startup, um, most corporations um, 
are not even thinking along those lines. So one of the reasons that Steve and I started working together is because we feel that we need to educate, mm -hmm. right, if, if first and foremost. Um, I, um, so Angelo said something really interesting, and I just want to say this again. When we started talking about three horizons of innovation to both each other, and then started talking to the C-level suite in large corporations, you almost get every time we do that, one of these collective, oh, now I understand what innovation is. Because everybody uses this buzzword to talk about 16 different things. And now all of a sudden we have a way to describe the degrees of innovation. And it allows you to hang your head and in a minute, and literally in a minute, you now have a common language of innovation, at least that's understood. And this level of education is necessary to even begin the conversation about innovation inside of corporate. But, but I was also going to say that, I mean, what, what I'm seeing is, number one, the, um, in, in most cases, even corporations that I call them H1 corporations, they, even though they have an innovation officer, chief or not chief, um, they, they are, those people tend to be staff level people or with a very small group. They, they cannot really affect much. Okay? Um, in fact, I would say that in many instances, the corporations that I consider that are really innovating they're not even doing it because they have a chief innovation officer. They may have most of the innovation that I'm seeing today in, in larger <coughs> corporations comes either chief digital officer who, who's getting a lot of budget or chief strategy officer in some ways. And again, it depends on how they define chief strategy officer. The other point I was going to make is that, um, again, the, the reason I keep focusing on, on this H1 corporation is because, one, uh, Horizon 1 uh, corporation, is because what I'm finding is that even initially I thought that uh, it's only Horizon 3 that corporations have a problem with. But it's not that. And I'll give you an example. This happened today. I was having um, a meeting with one of my clients, which is an insurance company, a large insurance company. And they were telling me about the fact that they wanted to move into Latin America, starting with Brazil. Uh, with, with, a, uh, with a casualty and property uh, product. And they were analyzing and they were doing spreadsheets and the CEO, the CFO was cracking the whip and all of that. By the time they decided to finally send somebody to start analyzing, they determined that there were already three local startups. Okay? These are not three guys and a dog, but still small private companies that they were already growing like the wheat. So now, so this is a, a Horizon 2 effort, which found them completely being disrupted. So now, rather than being offensive, as they thought they would be, now they immediately go on the defensive to the point of feeling that they will be disrupted. So, so that, that causes very, first of all, keeps you in very different uh, timelines on how you should be thinking of, of how to put together your efforts. And if you combine that with what happens in large corporations in terms of culture, speeds, now you understand why everybody is starting to take this startup um, threat for, for real, right? And they're starting to, to scramble, say, well, how, do I, how do I start to defend? And that's why, again, it's important to start establishing the language, start establishing the methodology, so that you give them something to, to think about. I, I still struggle though because you take a kind of established corporation, Fortune 500 company, and 98% of their revenue is coming from Horizon One stuff, yeah. and that's the culture, that's the business process, that's the leadership. How, in that sort of situation, how does, how do you envision Horizon Three happening, and and how does that mix with the 98%? Typically, it happens. Um, for me, the, 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 what I've seen the most is through an existential threat. So, look what's happening in the automotive industry today. Okay. Um, look at what's happening at companies like IBM. IBM has had 15 quarters of, of declining revenues. Okay. Well, what do they do? They start watching. Okay. This is an Horizon 3. Regardless of how you want to talk about it. Not with blockchain. 
for the concept. Yeah, but, uh, but here's one, one example. They, they started Watson because they realized that they need to now leapfrog if they want to, to get This into is a big market. idea for all of you in large companies. It turns out that innovation thrives in crisis and desperation. Um, or you're out of business. So, so, so th these are, I mean, the, the, the automotive industry right now probably has the, 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 most, the, the industry that's most represented in terms of innovation outposts. It has the largest, the most developed outposts here in the valley. I am, uh, every, say, every car company has, a, has an outpost here. There's probably about 250 people here. Mm -hmm. I mean, th this, is, this is a significant commitment because they realize that this is not going to go away. And, and now, I mean, you, you read, I think it was last week, maybe the week before, BMW said, um, we need to hire 20,000 software and data engineers, okay? <laughs> these, are, these are big numbers, I mean, because these guys are starting to think that going forward, they will, they're always gonna be a car company, but, data and software are going to play a much bigger role in their existence and in their revenue streams than they're playing today. So, so that, uh, Daniel, why don't you take off from this? Because, okay, so they now have a crisis. They now kind of get it. How do you do return on investment calculation about time, when this occurs, et cetera? <laughs> do I now start in your projects, and when do I do this? Well, you see, and this is, this is again, um, one of the things that we've observed is that a lot of times when, when corporations come here or they go to New York or they go to Herzliya in Israel or they go to Shanghai, they say, okay, great, I need to, to be present in, in this location. But um, because there isn't this principal discipline thinking of, of how we should innovate, they end up starting randomly. So they'll say, uh, okay, let's start an incubator. Well, okay, an incubator, for those of you who understand again, how these things work, and even you, uh, from, from a venture perspective, an incubator is a small team, three, four, five people, uh, with an idea, not even a business plan idea, but just an idea. And uh, they, they need to be, as, as Ravi knows, they need to be nurtured and, and, and helped and all of that. Um, and maybe seven to, two, to 10 years later, if everything goes well, and the mortality rate is extremely high, by the way, if everything goes well, then that may amount to something. Well, if, if you're a corporation in crisis, and you think that you will get out of this crisis by establishing an incubator, now you have, you have miscalculated, right? You, you have not determined how your horizon for, for solving that existential problem that you have relates to the return on investment that your initiative, your innovation initiative, in this case, to create an incubator, will be able to do it. So keep going a bit. What other initiatives could you do for... Uh, yeah, similarly, I mean, you can, again, we see a lot of corporations establishing venture funds. Um, so, in, just to give you some statistics again, um, in, in uh, 1991, uh, so, 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 so far there, there have been three major corporate venture capital uh, uh, waves. So, late 80s to early 90s, early 90s, there were about 200 corporate, corporation venture groups. Then, recession of 91 came. That was half. In, in 2000, there were 500 corporations with venture groups. By 2003, you know, 2001 recession came, 2003 came down to 275. Today, we have 1,200 corporations that have venture funds. I'm willing to bet that 90% of those do not know why they have venture funds. <laughs> so there's corporate VC, there's corporate incubators. How else can you do corporate incubators? Um, again, you can do you know, partner, uh, which which is, and, or you can acquire. Uh, and uh, those all have different time horizons. And they're all different. They are different. And 
that, that's the point. Now, if you're, if you're investing, again, if you're investing in early stage, so you use a corporation like Samsung, for example, that has both an early stage venture group and a growth stage venture group. Um, in the, 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 the growth stage venture group is thinking of uh, three to five year horizons. The early stage venture group is thinking in terms of five to seven year horizons, which is what most institutional VCs are thinking about. And my CFO is panicked about the quarter is thinking about an acquisition. That's right. So, so the, the, this, in, in thinking of an acquisition, by the way, it's better to thinking of a, of a meaningful acquisition. If, if they're thinking about, the right, because if they're thinking about, okay, I'm going to acquire somebody like Insira that VMware acquired for a billion uh, something, or Bebop that uh, uh, Google acquired with, you know, for 500 and some million, if I, if I understand correctly, uh, these are zero revenue uh, acquisitions, right? they're not going to move the needle. They're, they're going to have an impact on your balance sheet, but they're not going to move the, the needle. Mm -hmm. And, and most, time, most times, this, this calculus is not being done. It's a big idea. This goes back to the role of who is responsible for innovation as a strategy rather than innovation as a knee-jerk reaction in the 21st century I, corporation. I, I do, I do, go ahead, sir. And, and that's what we're trying to work on is actually, much like we did with the Lean Startup, if you think about the Lean Startup methodology, we didn't invent smart people, and it wasn't like we invented something that people weren't doing before. The whole thing started methodology was nothing more than codifying best practices of what great entrepreneurs have been doing, you know, like ever since they've been entrepreneurs. But we actually gave it a methodology and language, etc., that people went, oh, this is repeatable, and I could do that, and oh, yes. And, and by the way, just you heard it from me, Lean Startup is not the methodology for entrepreneurship. It's a methodology. And by the way, anybody time, Anytime someone tells you it's a D, anything, they're selling you something. Uh, I used to do that for a long time. But now that I'm retired, I don't have to do that anymore. Um, but that's what we're trying to do on corporate innovation. It's dawned on us that there's enough chaos going on, enough of this theater going on, enough of these acquisitions here, investments here, corporate DC here, these, everybody kind of trying to reorganize for innovation throwing out titles, chief innovation officer, and how do we partner, how do we whatever. It says, wait a minute, wait a minute. Well, you know, yeah, we could give you a cookbook, that's kind of nice, but what's the underlying theory of what's going on here? Why are we being disrupted? Why are the rules? Anybody remember Jack Welch in the 20th century, right? Now, you follow Jack Welch's rules in the 21st century, you're out of heaven <laughs> business in three years. Right? Anybody get an MBA in this room? And come on, you can raise your hand. <laughs> Not only are you, you, are you useless, you're dangerous. <laughs> not for execution. For execution, that stuff is timeless. But for innovation, you're dangerous. Because all those rules just don't work anymore. It's a big idea. And by the way, if your business school is still, still teaching you how to write a business plan, remind them that that's a great class that now belongs in the English department. This is the best example of creative writing you ever do. <laughs> but it has no use. <laughs> Yeah, by the way, don't get me wrong, and for existing products and existing divisions, of course you need an operating plan. It's just that we were trying to use a business plan, right, in a startup or even new uh, division in a corporation. No business plan survives first contact with customers, right, and therefore, anyway. Can I give one example, by the way? So we've been just kind of noodling about this one invention we kind of came up with that every time I show up, um, at least a, a corporate strategy group, they kind of go like this, is that, you know, when you set up an innovation group inside a corporation, let's say you figured out how to get those innovators and they, by the way, rule one of uh, standalone innovation in a corporation, you know, after 50 years of doing this, including starting with the IBM PC division, you never have a Horizon 3 group in the same building or physical proximity as a Horizon 1 organization. You know, I hope that's well understood. But what's not understood, and we now have a language for it, and I'm just going to give you one cute tactical example, is that we kind of understand the goal of those Horizon 3 organizations is not to become Horizon 3 organizations. The goal is eventually to get to enough scale, let's use IBM PC division, which in three years became a billion dollar division, such that it could be part of a Horizon 1 organization or stand alone big enough to be its own. But the interesting fact, and it happens in every company, not just yours, is those Horizon 3 groups create technical debt. 
You remind know what technical debt is? Technical debt is just like in a startup. You hack together code, you throw together hardware, you know, there's wires sticking out, you know, there's like best practices that would appall the, the FDA or no practices or whatever. You go, boy, if anybody ever see this, we're going to go to jail or the wings will fall off, but it doesn't matter. You're now climbing like this for $100 million a year in revenue. Congratulations. But we now have a word for what happens in Silicon Valley. Someone has to go and clean up their garbage. And that's called, and we now actually give it a word called refactoring. And we understand now in Silicon Valley that when your startup scales, you have to refactor the technology. But what we never understood in corporations is we also need, re need to refactor the organization. That is, while there's technical refactoring, there's also organizational refactoring. Because what you want to do is take that Horizon 3 organization that's now scaling and put it into the Horizon 1 process. But oh my god, there's an impedance in this match of not only the technology, but the people. There's no way that person you have running that crazy look of what used to be the Horizon 3 group, it, do you want them to be running a billion dollar division? I mean, they'll break things, and they'll maybe break your corporation. But the Horizon 1 folks don't want to take it because it's not quite perfect. And, Go ahead, finish up. And what we've been missing, again, I'll contend we've been missing this for 50 years, is that in a corporation, because every company I've always talked to on this tactical level, they go, oh yeah, we have these fights all the time, it's just when we think it's going to be successful and we're going to get it to scale, we get into this contest between, excuse the phrase, the technical term is a missing contest between the Horizon 1 folks and Horizon 3. No, I'm sorry? Yeah. yeah. And what we, what, what we realized is that what we've been missing is a full-time refactoring group. Full-time refactoring group. It doesn't have to be huge, but it has to exist in every company to kind of clean up not only technology refactoring, but organizational refactoring. Because the Horizon 3 people are no way going to be working in that Horizon 1 organization. You want them to have another career inside the company to start the next division, and you want a way to have this virtual circle of creation. I think you would. I, mean, I have a couple points to make here, because I hear this again very frequently, is that uh, just because you do not use cubicles in your corporation, that does not mean that you are innovating. Okay? <laughs> 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 or even corporate CEOs, and who with pride will say, we got rid of all our cubicles. And, um, and, and they, they believe that in doing that, they're really operating like startups. Okay. Um, and and the, other, the other point I was going to make is that, again, to build upon uh, Steve's point, is that um, what, we, what we've also seen is as corporations uh, start these larger efforts, or their efforts gain steam, the Horizon 3 efforts gain steam. Maybe inevitably, uh, there is a, a flow of employees from the Horizon 1 corporation or organizations to the Horizon 3 organization. And if that happens too quickly or too early, before, in other words, the or of the Horizon 3 organization starts to solidify, then you, you see this high growth period be followed by plateau and debt. Because the, you, you, so it's not only the impedance mismatch that you have when you're trying to bring it together, but when you have that, that flow of employees, um, it, you can also have very negative effects. So, so as you're thinking about how I need to design this and start to scale it, um, you need to be thinking all of these effects. And, and because a, a lot, of, when I got into this, being a technologist, um, a, a lot of times I used to, to think that, oh, corporations are coming to Silicon Valley because they want to hear about technology. And, and indeed, they, that's how they were expressing themselves. So tell us about cloud computing. Tell us about big data. Tell us about 3D printing. You know, whatever, whatever you term, the new materials. Okay. But the fact is, it's all about culture. Right. It's 
all about how do I define a new culture that will allow me to change the horizon one in a way that I create a balance. Because I, you know, if I'm a hundred billion dollar corporation, I'm not going to kill that hundred billion dollars just because I have some some good idea. But, but you need to create that that balance and and finding finding the right model to establish this balance. And it, you will definitely have a couple of different cultures. And, and then over time, you need to be thinking of how do I bring them closer, realizing though, and that's where the corporation needs to feel comfortable, that you may never have one culture again. You may have two, two mutually support. Have, but, but and you need to feel comfortable with that. Otherwise, all you're talking about is horizon line innovation. And in most corporations, that's why they will feel comfortable going forward with whatever consequences. So, so I want to double down on that observation that um, Angelo's just made. For those of you in the large companies, you who happen to be here in Silicon Valley, you know while the tech is part of it. The other part of it is that startups look like they operate and blur large corporations. That is, they move with speed and urgency. Anybody understand why what a startup CEO wakes up and goes to bed thinking about? Anybody know? What is a startup CEO? Three numbers. Anybody know what those numbers are? Burn rate. Burn, burn rate. What else? Money left in the bank, and day, hour, minute, you're out of money and shut it down. Right? <laughs> now, when you're in a big company, with all due respect, you know, maybe you get to lose your corner office. Maybe. In a startup, if you're a founder, you're probably going to maybe lose your house, kids are going to go to a different school, and, and for sure those hundred people working for you ain't going to be working there anymore. Right? That's what Evangelist and I, when we were doing startups, the CEOs worried about every day. So that's a different motivation that, while you can't create that exact uh, fear and panic, that is what drives startup at speed. And, and so, you know, when I was teaching young CEOs about how to kind of turn that into a set of heuristics, I'll give you one, for example, for those of you in large companies you might want to think about. As a startup CEO, I kind of got decision making down to just two ideas. There were only two types of decisions in every meeting, regardless of what the meeting was about. It was, is this a revocable decision or an irrevocable decision? A revocable decision was, what order do we do the features? What color is the box? What price is this? And what channel? They're all revocable. Some with more cost than others, but you're a startup. And by the way, the only conversation about revocable is, will we live long enough to worry about this? Not what corner case if the number of atoms of the universe is, because you always had smart people in the room who calculate every possible corner case. You've eliminated the corner cases because it said, if we should live so long, what's the, and then irrevocable is, who do we take money from? Do we sign five or 10 year releases or what? Some of those are irrevocable. But as a startup CEO, once you sorted it out into two buckets, uh, the rule in our startups were, you made revocable decisions in the same meeting they came up, period, end of discussion. There was no meeting to have a subcommittee meeting, to have a memo, to have another meeting, to schedule the conference room for the next calendar day, for the quarterly event, or whatever. By the time a large corporation had the next meeting, we have made ten decisions, moved forward on six, reversed four, etc., and constantly were moving at that speed, learning and iterating and moving. And, and so you got that cadence. Of, of, of momentum and speed and tempo that, and by the way, speed and tempo is an integral part of how we get urgency. And I just mentioned that because this goes back to trying to describe this to a Horizon One organization. And again, it isn't that people aren't making these decisions out of stupidity, it's that no, in a large corporation, these bets are $100 million bets sometimes. And gee, you do need a lot more certainty than a startup because there isn't a gun to your head on a daily basis, but you screw that up, you know, you might put the whole company out of business. So, so those decision processes More are, important than being 100% right. Yeah. And, and the consequences of uh, failing, I guess, are very different than a, in a large company. Right, but, but in a startup, if you really think about it, if you're doing a lean startup methodology, you know, failure equals learning, and learning equals failure. You know, we don't say that scientists are in charge of failing, right? We don't say that science is failing, but in fact, the scientific method is all about hypothesis testing, designing an experiment, you know, coming up with a hypothesis, designing an experiment, getting some data, and validating or invalidating the hypothesis. Guess what? That's the Lean Startup methodology. Truly, that is the Lean Startup methodology. And, and by the way, one, one last 
point here, uh, going back again to the corporate venture capital issue, is that one of the, one of the um, arguments that I often have with corporate venture capital groups is that I feel um, that they're not experimenting enough, right? And, and instead, they, they create in investment strategies and, and approaches to do just enough to test a few things, but but not trying not to fail. Um, I, I was talking to the, the head of venture capital and financial services organization, not Visa. Um, <laughs> the, the, uh, and and I, I I asked um, how when do you know that, that you're successful? How do your your CEO and your CFO feel that, that you're successful? And he said that uh, as long as I'm don't lose money, or maybe I lose up to 5% of what I invest. Uh, everybody's happy, and they don't pay attention to us, and we can invest. And, and this answer is wrong in two levels. First is that the fact that they don't pay attention is wrong. They have to pay attention, because otherwise, you're, you're, not, you're not helping the corporation. Right? You're not strategically helping the corporation with your investment. But the other thing is that, um, Institutional investors are prepared to, to lose nine investments out of 10, provided that the 10th can, can remake. And if they don't, if they, if they lose all 10, guess what? Their LPs don't give them money, right? And, and so you're not a runaway. Uh, that type of thinking uh, is not yet in corporations, and, and unless it gets into the corporate uh, thinking. Uh, I think we will be sitting here a couple of years from now, or maybe even sooner, and we will be lamenting. Don't VCs have the same uh, corporate VCs have the same problem, which is there is horizon one uh, metrics and culture Precisely. being applied to this venture capital, which is supposed to be very high risk capital. Precisely. Precisely. That's exactly what I'm saying. Is that the the, the reason the, the they're not experimenting enough, right? They, they would prefer to, to write three $20 million checks rather than, than writing $23 million checks. And, and in this way, look at a, at a broader variety of, of opportunities that even through their failure can help the corporation right. not take certain paths. Or and, and let's remember we're, and, and, and I don't mean to get into institutional finance because this is your daily whip, but Let's remember where most of this is driven from, which is both Wall Street driving the board, which is driving the, the management team to, you know, for short-term profits, and, and that's why we jettisoned <coughs> manufacturing, we jettisoned research, we jettisoned everything to make those numbers look good. But the problem is, of course, that's been self-defeating. Is that, you know, it's kind of made these companies more and more vulnerable to more and more outside forces rather than having their own. Um, kind of asset base of technology or, or something else. And I think if they don't do anything, the, the life cycle of companies will continue to decrease. You know, when, when, when you and I were starting uh, as entrepreneurs. And as competitors. And as competitors. Uh, but uh, what, was, what was happening was that um, at that time, corporations were thinking that, OK, I'll let the bench, the, the VC do something, and then I'll, I'll go ahead and acquire sure. it, right? But, but now the, the rules of the game have changed. And not only, as I was saying before, you have a lot more startups than even corporations can absorb, right? Even if they wanted to take that approach. Mm -hmm. but, but more importantly, the, the, the startups saying, why should I just get acquired for anything? I mean, look at what happened to cruise, to cruise automation, right? Okay, so. Without naming names, there was one company that went and told them, we like your people who will, who will take you for $100 million. And they said, no way. We, we think, I mean, I, I know that this is not imaginary conversation. <laughs> and then they, another couple of corporations came in and said, well, how, how, what about if we give you a couple hundred million dollars to acquire? I said, no, we, we, we feel we can take you on. These are corporations in the automotive value, value chain. Mm -hmm. And, and finally, GM went and said, what's going to take this off the table? And the number was produced. 
And they said, all right. What was, what was the number? A billion one. At least it started with a B, not an M. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, yeah. <laughs> but, but again, my, my, my point here. Big for big? <laughs> my point here is, is that uh, the co corporations back in the 80s started taking certain tax with their R&D organizations and in order to reduce their, their costs. And, and, and that's coming out by because of what is, how the field, the startup field, has evolved. Talk more about that. You know, I, I was at IBM research, TJ Watson, IBM research, and you know, you saw Bell Labs, and and you know, there's an inkjet coming out of HP Labs, and and clearly no one sees sort of these big uh, corporate research labs. You know, this it's a different form with Google X and all. We can talk about what that is. What, what happened to kind of these corporate research labs? And, and they used to be sort of the, the catalyst, the engine driving uh, kind of new innovation in corporations. I would claim that they, they evolved as organizations that support development, okay? With some <coughs> co-innovation capability. Um, Again, first of all, there aren't as many corporations anymore that that have the kind of research lab that, that we had, that we, we thought about what corporate R&D and central corporate R&D was in its heyday. Um, Bell Labs, Kodak Labs, you know, those kind of corporations. Uh, so, uh, so that, that is... That so is can, can I turn? So if you th think about the history of corporate innovation labs, at least as I understood it, um, you know, GE, Kodak, others started in the early 1900s, and by 1920, the notion of a domain-specific corporate lab was well established, and by the time World War II came around in the U.S., most every major industrial player had domain expertise of everything from basic to applied research. And if you wanted to work in chemistry, you went to DuPont, and photography, there was Kodak, and GE for you know turbines and everything else. Um, and World War II changed something dramatically in the United States. Anybody know what it was for research? Does anybody know how many, how many dollars the US government gave universities for research prior to World War II? Any idea? Zero. Does anybody know what the number is today? $60 billion a year. Right. So number one is the U.S. government became the primary source of basic research in, in the United States by funding not corporate labs, but universities. We take for granted that basic research happens for basic science from the seven billion bucks of the National Science Foundation, and then the NIH gives $35 billion a year uh, for both basic and applied research, you know, add in DOE and NASA and uh, the DOD, but, about half of that uh, from mostly applied things with pointy ends. Um, but, but at the end, so number one, um, it was U.S. government started funding research. Um, number two is, guess what happened starting in 1975? Is that VC started to fund startups at a scale of at least, you know, first billions, now tens of billions, and I don't know what's the latest number for a year for, for VC funding. How many? Another $60 billion now funding not basic research, but clearly applied research of basic science coming out of both universities and corporations. So I think we've seen the transition of, it's not that these labs disappeared, the rationale for if I'm a, cor if I'm a corporate CFO, I'd go, let me understand again why this is still 1938 and we ought to own, you know, a thousand people. Right? Also, uh, uh, let me add to these numbers. Look up how, how much money corporations are spending on stock buybacks. Okay. And Should be a war crime strap for that. <laughs> well, I, I mean, what, what is interesting is that, um, let me pick on IBM for a minute, and my apologies. Um, but, uh, uh, to work uh, uh, <laughs> that's why the apology. Um, if IBM would spend half of, of what he spent on buybacks over the past 10 years on research, Okay. They would have been, I claim, they would have been a very different story than we have today. They missed many trends. Mobility, cloud, social. Now, they made acquisitions. They tried to 
make some comment. But they were not looking at enough hypotheses out there, right? The, the research was focusing a lot on, on, what, on what the existing product lines were, maybe with a little bit of co-innovation with, with customers. But look how much they spend on, on buybacks. I, I do not have the exact number, to be honest with you, so this is not a trick question. It's just that, the, it, and IBM is just an example, but again, that's why I said my apologies. There is many, many corporations if you look at the, the trend between over the past 15 years and compare buybacks to R&D, corporate R&D. It's a great number. You, you, you will see that corporate R&D has remained steady, which means that the real dollars has gone down, okay? And buybacks kept increasing. Why? Because of short-termism. Why? Because hedge funds want CEOs to, to perform in a specific way. Guess what? I mean, we're adaptable so, animals. So let me be even blunter than evangelist. At least my conclusion about any company with corporate buybacks that exceeds their corporate R&D dollars should have a logo that says, we really don't know what the hell we're doing. Um, <laughs> but our CFO is in charge. Um, so, sorry, what was your question? <laughs> I'm going to switch gears now to kind of talk a little bit about you know, this Horizon 3. So, I heard you say, by the way, kind of put them in a separate place. It um, uh, reminded me of kind of, uh, you know, the Lockheed, the term was Skunk Works. You know, Lockheed had a separate kind of uh, a tent, I think it was. So, so, I think we now understand why. I mean, we could tell all these apocryphal stories about, you know, IBM PC division, Lock Lockheed Skunk Works, etc. But again, what we're trying to extract is, is what's, the, what's the lessons, what's the overall idea here? And I think the overall idea is that for innovation to succeed, and we see this in the valley, you need no rules, no plans, no processors, no key, no key performance indicators, at least nothing akin to what a Horizon One organization needs to have. It's not that the rest of the company doesn't need that. Of course they need that to generate you know, existing profits, plans, procedures. But the problem is when you try to overlay that stuff on creativity and provide instead of a, a, a broad bounding box or a narrow bounding, uh, bounding box, you strangle innovation in its crib. Uh, and, and so I think the heuristic is, no, 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 let it in fact you know, feel free. And, and how you actually go connected to the corporation is, this is a cheap hack we've now been trying and it works great, is you take all the supporting organizations who normally get in the way of a Horizon 3 organization, finance, HR, you know, legal, etc. And instead of stiff-arming them, you actually uh, force those organizations to task people inside the Horizon 3 organizations, except their job now is to get to yes, not to get to no. And they're incented to get to yes. A culture of yes. So a culture of yes. And therefore, there's, they don't work for the Horizon 3. They actually work for that Horizon 1 organization. But their incentive plan now is, no, no, no. You are, you're, you're supposed to clear the path. And i got to tell you, we came up with this. Um, did we started this five years ago at GE when we actually ran the first lean experiments in GE. Um, that was a high temperature sulfur battery division, which was starting inside the locomotive division. Don't ask me why. And, and, uh, and, and the, uh, Bunny and the head of the, the group had a $100 million check from Jeff M. Olt himself to go do this new innovation initiative. And so the first thing that happened is starting to staff his group. The HR people said, well, here's the most senior employees that you have to hire from. <laughs> and he called me up and said, that's not right. Is it? I said, no, 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 we need to work on that. And then year one's coming up, and the CFO comes to them and says, What's this? There's no like revenue from your group. And he's like, you don't understand. This is like a four-year effort. And the guy goes, no, no, you're in my P and L group. And so we had to go get finance to kind of understand. No, this is going to make up some numbers. I mean, things now we kind of look at, and you go, like, how can these? But you know what? It's pretty simple once you extract these and make them heuristics. That it's pretty. You can almost here's a package of how to set up a Horizon Three organization. I was also going to say in terms of scan words. For me, scan words represent. What's wrong with scan words? Yeah, yeah. So yeah. One, one good lesson, one bad lesson. Or one good lesson. <laughs> the, the, the good lesson is that scan words show that in order to, to start doing something very radical, very revolutionary, think of the SR71 and yep. Lockheed, right? You really need to put a group of people outside of the, the main organization, put them in Palmdale in that case, I don't know how this. The, the, bad, the, the bad aspect of it is that you keep them so isolated 
that what you're learning, yes. what you're learning in terms of culture, what you're learning in terms of technology, what you're learning in terms of business model, whatever the, the lessons are, they remain in Palmdale, right? right? And, and, and so, so there's never, so Scan works, whichever corporation set them up, as a lucky was known for, but other corporations set them up. Zero so part. The, the, there was never an effort to start something and then start bringing it together. Right. And I, I, I would say, think of, I'm a, the, the more I look at Google, Alphabet, the more impressed I become on, on many aspects. We were talking earlier here before the event started, and I don't know if you noticed this, this the news a couple of days ago, but Google is going to sell their robotics division. Awesome. The, the, the awesome. Yeah. yeah. And, and think of that. This, this corporation spent about a billion dollars to bring together a group of startups, which, by the way, that is important also because they realize that we buy one, we create a more, and then we need to, in order to build it up, we, if we need to accelerate that, we need to buy more, right? So, regardless of the time. <coughs> but, but now they're saying, okay, this is not working for whatever reason. What did we learn out of that? But now, out. We don't want it to be polluting whatever we're trying to do. And, and, that is important. And also, look at what they're doing, not only with Google X, I and mean, Google X is an interesting Skunkworks type of project, but Nest, YouTube. I mean, they surrounded the corporation with interesting initiatives. And they paid, in some cases, they paid really good money to do it. And they only started bringing them closer to the Horizon One Corporation, to Ed Corporation, as each of these initiatives started building core, solid core. And they will build, they will bring it only so close. Think of where Nest is in relation to the, the core alphabet business, right? Think of how YouTube only recently started becoming incorporated into that. There are some interesting lessons there in terms of how corporations should be, again, should be bring starting this kind of initiatives and bringing them close to their main business, because otherwise, um, and whether the main business becomes the culture of the of, right. of, of the outpost, or the outpost positively changes the core. Um, and, and again, there are some rules and heuristics that you kind of want to uh, encapsulate of best practices. Now, Facebook, Google, and all have kind of a very different culture from some of the more traditional Fortune 500 companies. These are not you know command and control, you know big hierarchies with lots of middle management. They're flatter organizations. They they tend to morph, uh, you know, more easily, and and maybe hence twenty first century twenty first century organizations because they're all young companies, and hence they're able to absorb a Nest or, or something or YouTube or or, or WhatsApp. Uh, but I'll use GE as an example of a company, and there are others, you know, W.O. Gore, I don't know if you know them, but the Gore-Tex folks, um, also the U.S. government is also uh, trying to do some of the stuff, and some of the Department of Defense and Intelligence community out of desperation and necessity. Um, so, you know, if you're, and I'm sorry to cut you off, but if your point was, can, can you know, old, old dogs learn new tricks, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and the answer is yes, but it requires leadership that understands uh, the necessity of doing this, and either has DNA themselves, or will much harder appreciate the DNA uh, of that this is required, and has good judgment of how to bring it in. And, and it's hard. Go ahead. And um, again, you were asking earlier about chief innovation officers. I have been working on a on a different concept, which I like to exemplify with with this with the corporation you mentioned, and that is a lot of times we started talking about the need for execution CEO and innovation CEO. And if you think about the companies that you mentioned, in, in Facebook we have Zuckerberg, innovation CEO, in my opinion, and Sandberg, execution CEO, even though the title is CEO. Yeah, Paige and Schmidt. Paige and Schmidt and Pikai. Yeah. In, in Salesforce, you had you, you, well, you have Benioff, the, the innovation CEO, as it turns out, and David Hu, who was the, the execution, the COO back. He has left now, so that role now has been split among two individuals. But and, and in Apple, at least in the, in, in the 
in its last re reincarnation when Jobs was around, but well, you might have always seen Jobs. You had Rubenstein and you had Avi and you had all the rest and um, underneath them that actually did the hard work as uh, as as operators and world class operators underneath them. And, and so almost all of these have been kind of dual acts about without ever kind of articulating that title and the whatever. And again, trying to extract the heuristics from this, it kind of dawns on us that says. Wait a minute, what if you actually institutionalized or at least created job descriptions about what is this operational role versus innovation role? And instead of being a chief innovation officer, which really almost sounds like a staff job, you're saying, no, 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 this is not like some, some staff function. This is the core of survival for the company. Now, now, for a good number of CEOs, that's a real ego thing, right? Is, well, no, it, that's chief executive officer says chief, I'm in charge. Okay, but well, you might be in charge of the Titanic. I'm not sure you want that job. Um, does that make sense? And so that's what we're struggling with. And, we're run and, and the good news is, for me, this feels like the beginning of the lean startup. Is that when I remember truly having this idea that when I was typing up, of all things, my memoirs, which I realized that I'd have to pay my kids to read. Um, <laughs> but literally, when I was typing it up and telling these stories, I realized. Everything I've been told about entrepreneurship by investors were wrong. How could that possibly be? And, I, and at the time, I was the total available market of one who believed in the lean startup. And then I convinced Eric Ries, and there were two. Um, this is where Evangelist and I are about testing some of these theories. So you're, you're hearing a good chunk of this for the first time. And we really believe there's a methodology for innovation in large corporations. But some of you are going to be the guinea pigs as we're going to go try some of these things out. And we have been trying them out. And we've been kind of surprised how receptive, I think. We both have found um, large tens of billions of dollar companies um, ha have been to this because I think they, they smell it. They just couldn't even give it a language. I mean, they knew it was broken, and they know it's broken, and they know it has to be fixed. They just were pasting stuff here and here. Is that? Yes, very nice. Um, so let's, let's uh, I want to kind of maybe, um, Two more questions, and we'll open up to the audience. Um, so, so one is just uh, go back to kind of just the customer development methodology, and we we are going to have uh, along with our friends here at Swissnex, we're going to be hosting hosting uh, Bernie Roth from the D School, and and they are the kind of proponents of the design, design thinking, thinking. Yeah. and right. how do you see sort of the two methodologies, especially for a corporation? and kind of when to use what, and uh, what's common, what's kind of different about that. So that's a great question. Um, and, and I got asked that for a couple of years, and I couldn't answer it until one day I woke up and said, wait a minute, I invented one of these. <laughs> I ought to at least be able to figure out what mine does. And how is it different here? And I, and I think I now understand. And I <coughs> jump to the punchline. For a corporation, they're complementary. And now let me explain how they're different and when you would use one versus another. So the Lean Startup methodology came from my experience of doing eight startups in Silicon Valley. And the startups I did, every one of them, with maybe one exception, were driven by technology. We had great technologists. We invented rocket science, or at least we thought we did. Steve, you're now the head of marketing. Get the hell out and find some customers. So the given was, here's the tech. Go find me customers, market, scale. Driven by tech, find the customers. And by the way, it's a startup, and so a startup, you have a gun to your head. So lean startup customer development was technology driven with extreme urgency, and therefore you heard me earlier talking about good enough decision making, that was the core. So start with tech, looking for customers, extreme urgency, good enough decisions. Lean startup, hold that thought. Design thinking, and, and I'm, I'm sure I'll get it wrong, so you should ask him when he's here on the D school, but basically started with IDEO and Procter Gamble. Said, look, we're not starting with tech. We own a whole ton of customers, and we know all about these customers. Yeah, we have some great R&D facilities, but we, we could talk to these customers, help us find new products for the customers. We don't know what the products are, but we know what the customers are. And by the way, we're Procter Gamble. No speed and urgency here. And I don't mean it's not, not important, but you know, take a week, take a month, take a year, and go out and do these investigations out in front of the customers. 
and come back and let us know if you find something. And by the way, this lack of speed and urgency is not a fault of design thinking. It is just the nature that there's no speed and urgency built into the process. It's not going to matter to P&G if you don't find a new product for them. And by the way, as an individual, if you don't succeed in doing that, you still have your job. Thank you. We'll put you on the next product. Remember where I come from is no, if you don't find product market fit for this technology, Die. You're, you're dead. So again, re remember speed and urgency. Yeah. So there's really a distinction between the two. Now tactically, they all are kind of on the, on the granular level sound the same. You're talking to customers, you're running experiments, you're finding out what their needs are. And by the way, there's a lot of stuff you know, we learned from design thinking. And surprisingly, there's not surprisingly, there's a lot of stuff they've taken from, from customer development. Um, so I think on the customer experiment stuff, but we are happy, at least when I run programs, with you got enough data, let's move on, and if we got it wrong, we'll go back again. Where in p and if I'm going to open up a factory, gee, I want to have more than good enough data, I want to have certain enough data to tell my management we need to spend a couple hundred million bucks, is that? Yeah. So the answer is, I would suggest in a corporation, you need to become knowledgeable about both design thinking and customer development and say, oh, there are two different tools and two different uh, scenarios. Is one coming from the technology group and am, is it urgent to find a solution? Or is one coming from, I understand the customers, but I'm looking for what products and you know, like we got some time. Mm -hmm. Like ROI, by the way, yes. the point that we were making about ROI, you need you need to think when to apply each one of them. Yes. Depending on when, when you want. Yes. Does that answer your question? Yes. Yes. Uh, let me ask my last question, real open to the audience. So, um, why bother with trying to do Horizon One, and Two, and and Three? It's very hard. You know, I worked in in three Fortune 500 companies. You know, IBM, HP, and and Iron Mountain. And, and uh, in HP, it happened because I worked for a guy called Joel Birnbaum, who was just a revolutionary, a radical. And he didn't give a crap what people thought, and he just took a machete and started swinging. So HP had Birnbaum, Chuck House, Chuck who, House, Chuck yeah. House, who invented 30 of their 45 divisions, yeah. one guy in HP. Guy. Yeah. But it's hard. Doing kind of Horizon 3 is hard. And why not just kind of do Horizon 1 and 2, which businesses seem to do pretty well, corporations, and, and acquire, periodically acquire Horizon 3 and, and integrate the culture and just keep doing it kind of on a continuous basis. You mean like Cisco? Used to. Like Cisco used to. And, and by, by the way, even Google and Facebook, Look at the, the, Facebook is buying big companies, they're buying small companies, but they're buying companies all the time. And I think they will continue doing that, and, and um, uh, there is, I actually believe that relying only on acquisitions, especially in this environment, um, you end up uh, having situations where folks, after they get acquired, they, they will leave. And so a lot of that, so you never get, so you acquire, you spend the money, I'm, I'm willing to bet on this with, with GM, okay? They spend a tremendous amount of money, um, and <coughs> if they, these people will stay for a couple of years, but then they will want to create something. They're saying they just something. won't realize the value of the acquisition. Uh, yeah, especially on the start. Now, it's very different to say I'm going to acquire a company that already has escape velocity, that has a proven model, right? Nest. It's a very, I mean, acquiring Nest was very different than acquiring YouTube, okay? Same amount of money, roughly, that, that was paid for each one of these, different multiple, okay? And um, so, so again, in the, in the process of... of what, what's very strategic, but why, why is one better than the other? I'm not saying one is okay. better than the other. One had revenue stream. Yeah. I'm talking about revenue stream, I'm sorry. sorry. I'm talking about revenue stream. So, so let me give you my shorthand for this one. One creates a financial acquisition culture, mm -hmm. and the other creates an innovation culture mm -hmm. over the long term. And, 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 you can put it off. If you, but, but, but I think that's no longer a sufficient answer. 
because I think we have enough, this is like climate change, right? You could still argue to the day where like water's up to here, whether it's true or not. But, but you know what, there's all evidence that our equivalent to climate change for corporate innovation is you're screwed now in the 21st century if you no longer have that DNA because the time is compressing from all sides. So you could say we'll still play the same financial acquisition game we've been playing for the last 10 or 20 years and hope the water's not rising. I don't think so. And if you believe it is, then, you know, great, these guys talk a lot and let us keep doing what we're doing. The argument we're making, by the way, in all, even the stuff that we've written today, is that a single, given the complexity of the problem and the, 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 the magnitude of the disruption where it's coming from, a single strategy is not sufficient. Yeah. Acquisitions with partnerships, with investments, with incubation, they all need to be working together, okay? And you need to have a strategy that incorporates okay, all of them, like with the right ROI, with the right horizons. I mean, that, that unfortunately, uh, it, it's, it's, it's complex, but it needs to be done. Blended approach of internal innovation, outposts, yes. uh, acquisition, VC. Yeah. And this has been talked about for 30 years. Um, you know, uh, the phrase ambidextrous organization was going to both Stanford and MIT, and I'm embarrassed to not remember the names of the professors. But it's not like we haven't been talking about this, and others, much smarter people haven't. But we never had the tools or the techniques or the tactics to then take it to the next level and say, now let me tell you specifically what to do, how to do, and, and when to do it. And we think we're pretty close in, in kind of figuring that out. So Good. thanks. Let's take some questions since there's a microphone here, so if you just line up there, yeah. I appreciate it. Good for yeah, just have the mic. First question from Svetlana from Gartner. Yes. <laughs> Welcome. I love the ball comes through. <laughs> well, are you asking whether Wall Street needs to innovate? Okay. Yes, and, and not not in Horizon Two, but Horizon Three. I think that Wall Street currently is causing stagnation because it's applying old principles to, in the 21st century. Do you mean? And it might make sense for many companies to go private. Uh, you have to. Yeah, I, I, there is already innovation that is happening and in, in that if you, if you think about all the, the secondary sales that, that exist, you think of what happens to employees of companies like Uber. Uh, they no longer wait for the company to go public before. So, so I think innovation is already, again, disruption is happening from below and, and at some point, you will have the changes, whether it is a New York Stock Exchange. I mean, NASDAQ has already started becoming more acquisitive. Okay? In Europe, you see exchanges merging. I mean, to me, these are signs that they, their CEOs are realizing that they're hitting a stagnation period. And in the meantime, you're, you're seeing innovation from, from below. And, and there, there are pockets of money that are going out to specialized funds to deal with providing liquidity to entrepreneurs and their employees okay, without having to wait for a traditional exit, such as an IPO or uh, a sale. Right. Over by Palantir, is an, and Palantir is another example of that, that executing on this. Okay. I agree with that. Okay. Yeah. Um, just give us your name. Sure. Um, Cyrus Shekeri from Inventures. Uh, so my question is, what is going to be the role of data, and especially big data algorithms, in reducing the cycle of innovation and removing some of the risks for big corporations so they feel that they can jump to horizon? The Well, I, I would say that corporations, and I see this now, Cross industries, and maybe they're they're coming to me because of my, my background. But I see corporations having become more sensitive and, and more cognizant of the value of the data they have, 
more than ever before. I've been in this business since 1983, in the data business. Okay, so so that that's a that's a good sign. Uh, there is now I would say that there is also a tremendous amount of noise from from startups and the investors and the marketeers that uh, promise a lot of things that I think will, will lead to disappointment. But the first encouraging part is for the first time, corporations are starting to really appreciate and say, how do we innovate through data? And corporations like IBM, and that's one of the bright sides of IBM, but corporations like IBM are really capitalizing that, right? And, and then you have Accenture, a bunch of other companies, SAP, or there, there are many, but, but you see it across, across industries. So, so especially pertaining to kind of the earlier discussion, when you, when you look at decision making and business decision making, um, you see even in organizations like Google, a lot of the middle management has been replaced. By what? By data driven decision making. And, and a lot of middle management is going to get roboticized. You, you don't need people making these kinds of decisions. <laughs> uh, introduce yourself. Yeah, I'm John Mashey, a tech advisor. Uh, uh, please tell us a little bit about your background, just a sentence. Uh, old Bell Labs guy who used to get dragged around to see customers by this guy. <laughs> John was the smartest guy I knew. <laughs> uh, so I have a question for Steve and then a quick comment while he's thinking about it. All right. So let's go back 30 years. You probably had some strong beliefs about startups. And the question is, have you changed your mind a lot about those? What do you think you had wrong? Okay. And the suggestion is we really ought to get together for breakfast and talk about what things worked and didn't in Bell Labs, because we actually did a lot of this stuff. In, in fact, John, you should publish again. You used to have that kind of levels of innovation, I remember, from yeah. Bell Labs, which I, I think are still uh, are still applicable. I think the, the biggest insight I, I had, which, which I gotta tell you I'm embarrassed from having done eight startups in 21 years, is that, you know, while we still tell founders the story is about passion and excitement and changing the world, etc., the minute they uh, touch any investor's money, they've just known original sin. But by that, meaning, while that might have been their belief the day before they got the money, but the day they took someone else's money, those people's business model now became theirs. And what I now know is that day that the founder's job is whatever it was about the product and whatever, that's still there, but their number one job now is liquidity. Period. Liquidity. People didn't give you money because they you know, want you to put a man on Mars. That might be nice. But they're not in the nonprofit business. They're in the for-profit business. And while they might like you personally and might really be passionate about what you're doing, at the end of the day, they have a business model. And I did not understand that in 21 years. If I did, I would have been a lot more efficient uh, as a founder. I still would have done everything I would have done building the company. But it would have been a lot more efficient because my VCs were horribly inefficient in educating me about how to actually position myself for maximum liquidity event. I guess that's the biggest learning. But I gotta tell you, as an entrepreneur, John, and you probably have the same experience, I went to have traded a day of it for any. I mean, doing what we got paid for in Silicon Valley. I mean, this is what crazy people do. Uh, and this is the only place in the world that you're either an artist or a founder where you get paid to do your passion. You know, entrepreneurship is a calling, it's not a job. It's the world's shittiest job. But as a startup, you know, like it's the best calling in the world. I mean, you can be an artist and starve, but here you could be an artist and a billionaire. What a great job. That's, but what's that breakfast, John? Hello, I'm Mathieu Pell. I'm from uh, Airbus Group. And my question is, you, you've talked a bit about uh, H1, H2, you've talked about H3 kind of innovation. Uh, could you elaborate a bit about the different mechanism that you've seen to basically transition H3 into the main business? Well, um, the, I'm not certain if you can transition it in an existing business. 
you may need you, you may need to to set up a, a completely new business unit. So uh, and there there are several. I mean, again, we talked about what IBM is doing with Watson. We we talked about um, you know what Google is doing, uh, what BMW is. There, there are several there are several such examples, and, and I think the um, to me what is important is you you do need to keep in touch with what H1, the H1 corporation is doing, right? You cannot be off in, in a tangent. And, and again, one of my laments for innovation outposts here in the Valley is that even the ones that are pretty well-established organizations, they, they tend to have very little connection to, to what's happening in the mothership, as I call it. So, so you need to be prepared for and the corporation to see that they need to be the board, they need to be prepared to set something new up as, as the H3 grows. It's not necessary that it will have to go into one of the existing businesses. And so let me just give you a, a small caveat. Um, I can kind of disagree here. I, I, I think in any corporation, part of this whole notion of uh, managing innovation as a portfolio and a strategy is would decide at what size and scale does it become a standalone division right. versus, you no, know, it's gotten to 10 million bucks, but that's not our criteria. Is it has to be 100 million or above. And 10 million is interesting, but let's put it in the existing division. And here are the rules, and here's what happens to those people, et cetera. Because if you don't set that up, then you've got these turf battles going on all the time. Uh, I think, the, in theory, the goal would be, in a perfect world, they'd all be large enough to move the needle as standalone divisions, but, it, but in some companies you'd end up with 400 divisions if they weren't. Right, but, but that's what I'm saying. It, it does not necessitate that you, you, that you create something new or that you put. You, you really need to make that analysis to determine what's the best way to, to do it. Okay. Thank you so much. My name is Sunny Yu. Uh, you've spoken mainly about U.S. companies, and I'm wondering if you see your counterparts and other parts of the world, especially Asia and Latin America. I'm concerned about Asia because H1 Horizon 1 thinking is very much part of the cultural DNA, top-down command and control. And so what is the implication for the other countries? Great, and great, global great question. What, is this a kind of, uh, how do you see this in a global context? About my pay, great. I, mean, I, I truly don't know enough. Well, actually, I'll mean, say that we do, we do see a, a very significant number of Asian corporations coming to the valley and and starting to try to understand you know what what things are going on. Um, uh, you know, uh, Singaporean companies, Indian companies, Indonesian companies, uh, just to make up on, on Asia, uh, and several of them have started establishing. Uh, outposts here, the Chinese, obviously, in Chinese companies. Um, and uh, I, I would say that the difference there may be the fact that they are, there's a much more deliberate analysis. Uh, the, the pace has not, has not picked up. The pace of coming here and, and exploring has picked up. The pace of okay, what we do about beyond the initial exploration may still be lagging compared to, say, American companies or, in some cases, European companies. And I think maybe that, and I will comment, because they, certainly in China they haven't exhausted their first horizon yeah, growth right. yeah, that's by right. at least another decade or so that's until they finally exhaust their own internal market and because of the barriers they've put up for external competition. Um, they're not going to have many of those issues until right. much later than us. Because many of them feel like Horizon 3 companies, Baidu, DJ, uh, they feel yeah, like Tencent. Horizon 3 no, companies, Tencent. Tencent. They yeah. act like Tencent, Horizon 3 companies. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, gentlemen. <clears throat> My name is Philip Dursey. I'm with E-Trade. Um, I have a, a question and a comment. Um, you touched on this transition uh, from sort of error reduction to innovation and through this uh, Horizons model. And I wonder if you could um, elaborate a little bit on some of, some of the cultural mechanisms, uh, best practices. Uh, you, you highlighted the importance of the cultural uh, transition. Uh, I wonder if you have uh, some best practices to share. 
Okay. So, you know, um, um, there's a lot of reasons why innovation turns into posters and not practice. Um, you know, probably the biggest one is uh, what I call the entrench in the middle. Um, you know, what you'll see in a large corporation, measure thousands, tens of thousands of people, is the CEO sends out the memo, the, you know, executive says, see, we've done our job. You know, the, the innovators on the bottom get the memo and they're going, yeah, you know, the company gets it. And then it kind of dies. And now the diagnostic is, why, why the hell did that happen? Well, you can, kind of can break it down to a couple of reasons. One is threat to existing management. You know, power, people, you know, pay, you know, et cetera. And we'll talk about that. Uh, two is, though, almost always, um, you know, lack of communication. Just because you sent out one memo, wait a minute, I've been executing my Horizon One job for the last 15 years, and this memo, did my job description change? No. Did my incentives change? No. Did my anything change? Did I get trained? No. Did like, but there's a poster, you know? So, you know, like, the first thing I say is, so did HR, H1, uh, excuse me, HR put together a, you know, a lean methodology program for innovation for the other 10,000 employees in the men? No, not really. Did anybody's, like, uh, KPIs change? No. All right, so one is, Let's focus on over communicate and educate and change KPIs, incentives, and whatever for the middle that actually needs to make this work. And then the, for the threat issue is you need to kind of let people know, know their job, or not going to eliminate jobs or turf or whatever. But there's always a saboteur, um, one that everybody knows is the saboteur. Um, and basically, you know, this is just my style. Uh, though it's been incredibly effective. Everybody knows who that saboteur is in the company. You hang one publicly. One publicly. Gets everybody's attention that the CEO serious. I, I have to tell you that at least ends that threat issue. No so, evolution without some blood on the Just one. Um, and and I, this is just my style. Your company style might be different. But, but I truly want to focus on the middle part which truly is education, training, et cetera, about what does this just mean other than we just had a nice conversation. Did I answer part of this? Or? Uh, yeah, mainly. I, uh... And by the way, of all companies that does this education well, GE and FastWorks does probably the best example. Eric Ries kind of ran through, I did, did the prototype in the transportation division, but then he rolled it out with Beth Comstock across the entire corporation. You, uh, you mentioned the uh, skunk, uh, skunk Works. Yeah. Uh, as an example, I wonder, and you briefly mentioned the uh, the IC or intelligence community example. Uh, are, you, are you referring to red teaming or uh, some other methodology for like groupthink mitigation, that kind of stuff? Um, so um, one of the things uh, that happened with the lean startup was, uh, you know, we had this great theory, but we had no practice. So I started a class at Stanford five years ago called the Lean Launch Pad. And go long story short, I'm going to get to your answer. And second, it was adopted by the National Science Foundation and the National Institute of Health as the standard for commercialization of science in the last five years. So we've put close to a thousand teams of principal investigators through it. Uh, last August, the president announced more federal research agencies piling on DOE, HHS, etc. And he accidentally announced that oh, the NSA as well. And so. <laughs> So, and everybody would go, what, including the NSA, who now has to admit the fact that there is a uh, lean startup uh, um, initiative inside the intelligence community that is attempting to move ideas into practice at a rapid speed to match the threats of the country. Does that answer the question? Is that uh, I was thinking more in terms of uh, cultural change. The, in so, so that's much harder, and the other thing we're trying to do is that, as you know, there's islands of innovation in the DOD intelligence community. And one of the things we're starting uh, next Tuesday at Stanford is a new version of this class to connect tech resources in the form of tech ROTC for the 21st century. We're starting a class called Hacking for Defense, which we're taking um, students and tasking them with real DOD IC problems with these islands of innovation. And if it works at Stanford, we hope to scale it to 50 universities across the country. Thank you, that was helpful. Hi, uh, Bobby Hyde with NetApp. 
Um, I wonder if you could make any comments on uh, a kind of different kind of innovation, like business process innovation. Um, for example, taking an existing product to market, say as a managed service where you were selling it before, or if you wanted to fundamentally change the way that your organization is collaborating, things that are kind of still linked to the original organization. Can we yeah. learn anything from these those kinds of uh, endeavors? Uh, and what was the last part? What was the last part? Um, Communication. You said something about communication and collaboration. Oh, it's saying, for, for example, if we wanted to fundamentally change the way that we are collaborating yeah. as a company. So that's a good question. So can we apply the teachings that you have here to those sure. kinds of innovations? So, so it turns out that this is actually back to the core reason why Alexander Osterwalder invented the business model canvas. Um, in fact, if you buy his book, Business Model Generation, it's exactly the handbook to do what you just asked for. And I would go look on his website, strategizer.com, and it's perfect for those kinds of conversations. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Let's take our final question. Our final question. So my name is Jin Zhang, and Steve, I came here because I wanted to learn something from you specifically about how you went after those markets, or in my view, you even discovered some of those markets. Which market? Um, the, the various market you've gone after, that's techno, technology leaders. Yeah. So let me tell you why. Um, I currently work for CA Technologies, and I lead one of these incubations, technology driven. This is how we started. But my biggest challenge right now is if you think about our green canvas, you look at a problem statement, you actually go to the far right and looking at your market segment, where you're targeting. What I've discovered here is while we're really small, my definition on far right is actually significantly different from the sweet spot of my larger company, i.e. the sweet spot or the strength of my larger sales machine. So that gets me the challenge to say, even if I tackle this market really well, I can't really scale, I can't really get it out to the strength or the, you know, the bigger sweet spot of my entire company. So I'm hoping you can give me some advice on how did you deal with that? So, I missed the first part. You're part of a larger company? Yes, I'm part of CA yeah. Technologies. Yeah, so I'm, and, and we'll take this offline, but I think the, the part I missed was what was your charter? My charter is to work on a specific technology incubation yeah. that meant to be, um, you know, one of these new. But is it to create a new business opportunity or is it to give the existing channel something else to sell? I think that is exactly for us to be decided. Well, and there is the, the, that is the question. <laughs> right. Right. That's, not, that's not which customer segment to go after. That's a strategy question that you haven't answered yet that, that before you could even start filling out the business model canvas, it requires a lot of yelling in a conference room. <laughs> and I mean that in a, in, in a polite way because if you don't kind of get that like cashed out, then you end up having these kind of conversations which are second order effects that we didn't have the more painful conversation is, wait a minute, you asked me to do X, I did a preliminary investigation and found out, gee, the earliest adoption has nothing to do with the strength of our channel. Do you still want me to continue? Or, because I'm going to end up having to create a secondary channel distribution, which the VP of sales will say over my dead body, let me tell you how that's going to play out. Should I shut this thing down now or should we continue going? And that's, yeah. this, this, by the way, is what the, the situation you're describing is a lot of what we're seeing corporations in that they, they, when they think about innovation, they stop at technology innovation, as opposed to thinking, okay, in order for me to bring it all the way out of fruition, I really need to be thinking about business model innovation and sales model innovation and, and, and the like. I mean, it, again, I will finish up with the automakers. A lot of the automakers, when they think about Tesla, they, they focus on the technology of the car. Okay? And they ignore the fact that Tesla sells directly to the consumer by passing dealers. They, are, they allow you to customize the car, and then they allow you to update the car, which, which has all sorts of other uh, ramifications, right? And, and so as you're thinking about this, you really need to expand your thing to go beyond technology your management needs to be educated about that. You really need to educate them that this is not only about technology. And let me, let me give you one other just um, maybe despairful story, which is 
Um, everybody remember Fairchild Semiconductor and Silicon Valley, first semiconductor company. And, you know, their first products weren't integrated circuits. They were making diodes and transistors at the time, silicon transistors, which was a hot product. They had a world-class sales force, and their sales force couldn't keep up with the orders. People were grabbing the diodes and, and transistors out of their hands. And then you know, guys named Noyce and Moore invent integrated circuits. And so, great, integrated circuits, new product line. What do you think their VP of sales said? Over my dead body. Over my dead body. Why on earth? It was, it was like now we could put tens of transistors, maybe even 100, on a same piece of silicon. What genius is this? Any idea what a VP of sales said over my dead body? What kind of sales force did he build? What did he have? He had an order taking sales force. Had anybody ever designed things with integrated circuits before? No. Which meant the sales force needed to stop selling and now have consultative sales, which would have slowed down sales and cratered the existing revenue plan. So from the point of view of the existing sales, sales VP, it made lots of sense. And by the way, he delayed Fairchild getting into this business for three years. In hindsight, not knowing what we know now, that every time I hear this story, I turn to the CEO and say, great, we're setting up a separate sales organization because it's a different, and of course, your VP of sales always says, I'm going to quit and whatever, and you show them where the door is, and, and you explain to him why this needs to happen, and you make sure he understands his commission's not going to go down, but, but this is what kills innovation in the large companies. Right? Does that make sense? And not that, but, but these are the conversations that need to be had, and, and you can almost always bet that there's a VP of sales going, no channel conflict and whatever, because that's because their K, the KPIs and incentives are not aligned for your uh, where you want them to be aligned. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.